live. Welcome. We are going live. We're live. We are probably live. Hello, everyone. How Good are day. you all doing? Uh, I feel obligated to immediately open this with uh, with a thank you to uh, Chris Kingan, who's just dropped in a $10 super chat. There's a little hey. something to start things off. Thank you very much, okay. Chris Kingan. I would offer you a Ferrero Rocher. Oh, sorry. Uh, Ferrero Rocher. Oh, you've got some too. That's amazing. We didn't plan that. Genuinely didn't plan that. I'm so happy you have some as well. With these Ferrero Rocher, you are spoiling us. So... <laughs> I would ask you for our Rocher. However, it will be quite expensive to post it to you, so I won't. I was going to ask, am I the ambassador or are you the one who's... or, or are you? <laughs> oh, it never gets up. I, I wish I had... I, I wish I, I brought in the little snippet of the old TV advert that all the UK crowd will know what I'm talking about uh, with the well, ambassador's party. those who are 30 plus. Uh, yeah... Anyway, I'm, I'm glad our Ferrero Rocher joke landed, so... <laughs> yes. In the meantime... Don't... Sorry, carry on. I was just going to say, don't forget, we're kind of old now. Yeah. Oh, well. Well, moving swiftly on to more <laughs> treats. I have not had a proper lunch today, so I'm very hungry to start this off. So the other thing I'm also going oh, to be partaking in Lord. is I have I have some Dutch Stroop waffles. For those of you who don't know what they are, they're these little waffle things. It's a double waffle with caramel in the middle. And what you do is you take your you take your tea or your coffee and you put it on top, like that. And the heat from the tea and the coffee warms it up and makes it go soft and gooey. It makes all the caramel inside go soft and gooey. And it's a delightful treat while you wait for your hot beverage to cool down to drinking temperature. So, uh, so yeah. That's where we're at. Um, Logan Parker doesn't like them. I'm sorry. However, this is what we're going with now. So, yes. I... And yes, we both live in England. Yes, sorry. I have greatly confused myself and have managed to get my Discord broken. Good job. So, well, I, I will... Uh, I'll, I'll carry on talking to everyone then. Um, Whatever. I will, I will ignore all of the messages I'm getting because I can't mute it now. <laughs> okay. At least we don't hear that, so yeah. Yeah, um, I just have badunk, 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 badunk. Oh no. Like, okay, Yeah. whatever. Well, so far my second day of 2021 goes fairly well. I'm in the shop. To, this is the first time I've been in the shop since the 23rd because on the 23rd of December at 6pm, I put down everything that I was holding and I walked out the door. And I was like, I'm done. Um, and I was like, I really don't want to walk back into that on Tuesday. So I came, I thought, we're, we're, doing the, we're, we're doing the podcast today anyway. So I'll come into the shop, pack down all the cardboard and actually tidy the place up. So when I come in on Tuesday, it, the shop is actually ready to work kind of thing. So I've been doing that. Um, so yeah. Um, and so, yes, my day's been going quite well. It's been nice to come into the shop. I feel a lot better about things now, and I think Tuesday is going to be less horrifying. So, yeah. Mm. It's important. Oh, that's not had long enough. My my coffee's gone too cold. It's not worked very well. Oh, well. So, yeah. How's First your holiday? world problems. <laughs> How's your holiday been, Caradog? Yeah, I realised on New Year's Eve that I've been in the office every day since the 7th of December, except for Christmas Day. Oof. So I was just like, oh, I need to not go in the office for a while. Yeah. That's why I, this is the first time I've taken any kind of serious Christmas holiday. Usually, I don't work Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, um, and I usually take off Boxing Day as well, because that's when I see my family. Um... However, then, any other days in the middle, I'll open up the shop because I always find myself thinking, A, eh, I've got nothing else to do, and B, because self-employed, every day that I'm closed is not just a day that I am not getting paid, because I don't get paid per se anyway, um, but it's a day that there is no income to the business. So it's not just that I take a day off, it's an actual loss of income. 
Mm. So I don't like taking holidays for that reason. However, this Christmas, I'm just like, I can actually take a holiday at the moment. I've got enough money that I can take a slight hit. Um, and I'm going to take a week off. You know, there's like a whole week between Christmas and New Year's. And I don't care. I'm just going to take the week off. And I feel good about it. Mm. So... So yes, that was yeah. nice. And it's important to take that time off and just get some recharge. I, yes. It's been made worse by 2020. Hmm. Because I don't have anything to do right now that doesn't feel like I'm doing work. Hmm. Everything I do feels like work. And the only way I can avoid that feeling normally is when I go out and I just go sit somewhere with other people and I'm like, uh... phone is on mute, phone is on mute. Everything else is in the office and I'm just sat talking to the people who are around me and I can't do work mm. because I do not have the tools and I can't think about it because I'm required to engage in conversation. And it's just a case that I haven't been able to do that. And taking time off and not going into the office feels pointless when I'm just sitting at home. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's been very difficult this year for me to actually not work. So, yeah, I'm just hoping that, obviously, right now it's not happening because new strains, mm. but vaccine and so on, will at least mean that I might be able to see a couple of people and just do the same again, but smaller. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, it's a it's a real problem. Um, and yeah, it will be nice when we can when we can hang out because I know what you mean. It's just um, it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's just like when we used to hang out down at um, uh, when we used to down out down the coronation and stuff. It's sometimes it's not about like sometimes you think sort of all we do is just sit around and drink cider but sometimes that's a good thing because you know generally speaking yeah we're just sitting around just not doing anything else and there's mileage in yeah. that so exactly it's certainly yeah. it's it's the case that because i don't have my computer with me it's because i'm talking to people who don't work in the industry mm that's what separates it. So it's a case of obviously just sitting around and talking to people at home. I'm like, oh, I can double check that thing. Oh, I can look at that. Oh, I can double check this. Yeah. Because I have the ability to, it feels like, it feels like I'm wasting my time if I'm not doing it because yeah. I have the ability to do it. I have the same issue with content cons Ah, I have the same issue with content consumption. Uh, and yeah. in a way, content creation as well, where um, uh, I was I was saying to someone the other day that it's not very often that um, it's not very often that I sit and play a full screen immersive game where I'm not doing anything else. Whenever I'm playing games, I'm often I often gravitate toward games where I can have a video on at the same time, um, and that means that the game can't have lots of music i need to have the music turned off or turned right down so i can be watching the video while i'm playing the game um because i'm just like j like i have to make sure that i'm doing like consuming two things at once all the time otherwise i feel like i'm not getting the most out of oh my time my. yeah um and uh, yeah and uh, so it's it's a similar kind of issue where you feel like if something if you could be doing more you should be doing more which makes it difficult to switch off so yeah um but it's at least we're uh, being aware of the issues is a is a start of trying to solve it i think so yeah absolutely i i, mm. I i'll be honest and say i could not play right now forza horizons without having the music cranked hmm. because the uh hospital radio yeah is called on there it's so banging isn't it oh it is it is genuinely 
the YouTube playlist that I put on when I was playing Dirt 3. Yeah. Kind of thing. It's basically that. And I'm just like, oh my god, you've actually finally got a driving game that's actually got the music that people yeah. drive to. Or more of a case of, it's all the music I play when I'm driving... I was about to say driving like that in my car, but I don't <laughs> drive like that in my car. <laughs> Forza Horizon reasons. 4 is Forza Horizon 4 is really good at making you feel good while you play the game. Uh, which is really yeah. what catches me about it. Like I don't really like arcade racers. I want something with more realism. But Forza Horizon 4 is so good at making you feel good while you play it that you don't yes. care and it's just a good time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's also the fact that I like that um uh, for, 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 for Forza Motorsport 7 feels mm. similar, but is the grittier, sweatier version, in, in a sense. It is the track racer version, which is aiming more at being a little bit more yeah. sim-like and so on. But it doesn't go full-on, straight out the other side, mm. you know, iRacer I... kind of thing. <sighs> yeah, and I, I really don't... like that. I need to try it again because I have only briefly, I've only briefly touched it, and I, I it was at a it was at a trade show with a full wheel and full wheel setup and everything. Big, you know, when you've got a, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, what, what the kind of thing you see at a show where they've got a big TV in front of you and you've got the wheel and the racing seat, the whole shooting yeah, match, yeah, absolutely, and absolutely. Uh, and I sat down and I had a quick go and I couldn't get on with it because the game wanted. Re wanted super realistic handling and braking and like if you stand on the brakes yeah. your wheels lock up and you slide into a wall and die yeah, however I but, like but obviously that. the the cage and the chair and the wheel don't give you the feedback you need for that yeah, absolutely like when you're driving a real car you know when your wheels have locked up you know yeah. however yeah, when you're when you're holding a wheel on a computer game you don't know when the wheels have locked up. Yeah. All you know is your steering isn't working and you slide into a wall and die. So yeah. it doesn't work I, for me, but then I, I haven't like tried the it with the gamepad. Yeah, the reason I like it is because it scales to that, but hmm. you can take it down in very granular levels all the way down to it's effectively an arcade racer. Okay. And That's I like that it's got that granularity so you can choose. You can go, I want traction control, but I don't want ABS. Or I want ABS, but I don't want yeah. traction control. I want neither. I want both. I want steering to be simulator steering so it feels like it gets yeah. heavier. Or I want it to be arcade steering. I want steering assist. I want braking to be, you know, basically linear. Or I want progressive braking. Or I want braking yeah. assist. You have all of those stages and little twiddly bits. Yeah. So you can dial in an experience which is the experience you're looking for. That's good, because again, is... you know, like on Forza Horizon 4, I play with pretty much all of the assists turned off, but I have ABS turned on for literally the reason that I just spoke about. Yeah, because, because having ABS you don't turned have off is control. a joke. Yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. A, a, pa a paddle thing... on a gamepad is not, is not a brake pedal. One thing I will say is playing with this over any mm. of the other controllers I've used. I can feel so much oh, more. Oh, that's true. You get a lot more feedback through the triggers, don't you? Yeah. Because they've got they've got rumble triggers. Yeah. So I get like, a if, you if, get a little bit of rumble in the triggers on the normal gamepad, but it's not good enough because when you're holding down the trigger, you completely suppress the rumble. Oh, you, I see. No. You, only, you only feel yeah. it when you're halfway on the triggers, which is such a shame. It's so yeah. close, but not the quite The other there. thing I really like about it is if you're accelerating, you can feel the car fighting as the rear end slipping. Oh, that's cool, yeah. And if you're so actually you get getting that, that feedback, yeah. It's not particularly granular. It's yeah. very on-off, but it's just a case that it's there. It's a it's lot like, better than that's getting actually nothing. Really nice. yeah. It's actually really nice. You can't really do anything with it, but it's just nice that it's there. Hmm. And yeah, and the other thing I... The other thing to me, though, that I just like about it is the fact it's USB-C. Like, <laughs> yes. finally a controller <laughs> that's killed in micro... Mm. Be... Yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. Right. Oh, um, but to move, I was just going to say to move the conversation quickly to real cars, I finally got an update from VW about when the Golf R Gen 8 is coming out. All right, yeah. They announced it December 7th. Yeah. They expect the demonstrators to reach the UK 
in May. Okay. So they're allowing people to buy them. Yeah. Where they don't expect the demonstrators to be available until May. They That's expect the deliveries to happen like September, October time. Yeah. Maybe. And I'm just like, that's dumb. That's so dumb. I Part feel like, like VW's <sighs> completely lost its direction because they have failed to launch their past like four cars. Yeah. I, I, I'm not at all surprised to hear that. But at the same time, I'm like, yeah, that's dumb. I, I wouldn't put down money on something that I'm not going to get for a year. Not by a long yeah, shot. Exactly. But on the other hand, it's a v, it's a VW. You know it's going to be good. Or at the very least, you know it's mm. not going to be bad. You know, mm, that, that's the thing about the Golf. You can't go wrong with the Golf. That's mm. what makes it magic. But interesting. Yeah. The I'm, other thing is mm. it's a it's a whack ton more money. It's £40,000 now. Ooh. Okay. I mean, I know it's a nice one because, like, what was your previous one, a Mark 7? Uh, 7.5 pre-refresh. 7.5 pre-refresh, yeah. they really screwed the Golf R with... There, there were three versions that were the Gen 7 one. There was the Gen 7, the Gen 7.5, yeah. which had a minor facelift and minor internal tweaks. And then, like, three months after they did that 7.5, mm. they did a facelift on it and refresh. Fair enough. At any rate, like your 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 old golf was a really nice place to be, and you know yeah. it did feel super premium. But just yeah, forty thousand though. Your um, I, I, yeah. I mean, you're you're getting into. I mean, I, I'm I'm thinking like you know you're into super saloon territory there, um, mm. but on the other hand, it goes toe to toe with super saloon. So why mm. wouldn't they charge that much? So yeah, I don't know. Yeah. The only thing, that, from my perspective, the thing that annoys me is they didn't push 400 bhp at this one, or no. they didn't drop the weight to like 11, 1200. What? what it's going to weigh like 1.8. Ooh, that's that's going to be it's going to be tubby. And yeah. Like, and what's the power? Like 310, uh, 312. Yeah. So it's like, whilst that's a lot of power, it's really heavy. Yeah. I can get 300 out of a 1400 kilo car. I was going to say, I mean like we we never did put your golf toe to toe with my with my legacy, but you know, mm. my legacy is 280 uh and weighs just under 1400 kilograms. You know. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you're you're going to have a 20 year old car, granted that was a super saloon of its day, but a 20 year old car that can go toe to toe with the brand new Golf R. Mm. Yeah. I mean, obviously I know the tra it, it would lose because the tr because the transmission is slow. As we've we've had this conversation before whereas, you know, mm. my car changing gears is is a is a sledgehammer. You go chunk chunk through the gears. Whereas obviously the Golf R is going to go bra 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 up through the DSG gears and that means it's yeah. going to win. However, just like brute just straight power, it's actually going to be an even battle, so Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's and and that makes me sad. It makes me sad that the reason the Golf R is in the position it is, according hmm. to two people at two different dealerships I've talked to, who are both full on petrol heads, yeah, is because the prim primarily the people who buy the Golf R are people who are sixty seventy, Ugh. because it's the only four wheel drive Golf, Ugh. and they buy it because it's the only four wheel drive Golf. They're never going to go fast enough for it to matter if it's four-wheel drive or not. No, but they want a four-wheel drive Golf. So I don't get why VW doesn't make the R line have four-wheel drive and then make the Golf R yeah. four-wheel drive as well, but also stripped to hell. So it weighs like, you know, 1,200 kilos and has a single seat in it and a yeah. milk crate. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, it's probably one of the, the, the four-wheel drive system is probably one of the things that makes the Golf R so heavy. Um, because yeah, that'll happen, especially because it's a very sophisticated four-wheel drive system. You know, again, as opposed to old Subarus, which are not a sophisticated four-wheel drive system. The the only thing that makes the four-wheel drive in old Subarus good is the fact that it's symmetrical and mm. has you know maybe an LSD at the back, but that's about it. Anyway, mm, I feel like we should probably start talking about tech. You know, I mean, they're highly related. 
I mean, have you this seen the amount of electronics in a Hadlex four-wheel drive system? A, a horrifying amount, I would imagine. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. However, I'm going to talk about tech on this tech podcast. So there. Um, so I want to talk about... Um, I, I'm going to briefly cover just a couple of people have been commenting on them. Uh, the video that came out. Was it yesterday I put it out? Or was it the day before? Anyway, we put out... Um, uh, or I put out the video of um, uh, Kyle's build that uh, we did together uh, back in end of October. It took me ages to get that video done. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, it's had some mixed mixed feelings. A lot of people really enjoyed the video. So thanks for everyone who really enjoyed it. There's a little bit of a disagreement with some of the parts and like some people weren't into the case and stuff like that. I like the case... Um, I, I was a little bit sad about the P400A um, really showing its age in terms of lack of um, lack of top mount radiator, which is just mainly just not... Like, there are some cases where you can't top mount the radiator. That's fine. It was a design choice. But the P400A, you can't top mount the radiator because of a stupid design flaw, not a choice. It was a, It was a lack of foresight on their part. Not just merely the fact of, you know, there are some cases where they were like, no, this case is, is going to be too small to do that. Deal with it. I'm like, okay. However, the P400A, it's not too small for it. They just put the screw holes in a really stupid place. So mm. I was a little bit sad about that. Um, yeah. And, um, uh, and yeah. Um, interestingly, a lot of people, I, I've had quite a couple of comments of people going sort of, oh, you're wrong about the water cooling. And once again, I'm not sure what they were referring to there unless, however, I did notice that this week, um, Jay's Two Cents put out a video about inverted um, uh, hoses up, hoses down, saying basically, you know, stop telling people that hoses up is wrong. And firstly, thanks a lot, Jay. I appreciate you. Uh, well, I sounded really sarcastic then, but in all seriousness, I really appreciate that video going out because, my God, I'm sick of getting crucified on my older Is that videos. Is not a British thing, though? Yeah. Just, it's impossible for a British person to say, good job. Without well sounding... Done. Yeah. Congrats. Without sounding Thank sarcastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. Without it sounding passive-aggressive or sarcastic. You know. Yeah. That was um, so good. However, I actually well think done. <laughs> I actually think the opposite has now happened because now Jay has put out that video where I've where I've just released a video where I put the hoses down. I've now got people saying radiators upside down, and I'm like, ah, it's unwinnable fight. Whatever way round I put it, people complain. With yeah. what? Oh, and just yeah. I literally can't win, no matter what way, wherever I put that radiator, I'd have had people in the comments telling me I was wrong. And I'm like, you know what? I don't care. Whatever. So anyway, so that happened. Someone else, I lost who it was, said, um, any chance of you guys doing a full water cooled with hardline, uh, hard, hard pipe build and stuff like that? I really want to do that. I really want to get into real water cooling. Because obviously we've done a bit of water cooling with your rig, Caradog, and I mm. definitely got the itch for it there. The reason why I haven't done it is it's just really expensive. Um, however, where I'm finding myself with a bit more budget to play with on some projects now, um, I really do want to do a proper hardline build. Um, so um, yeah, I mean that might be something that we end that that it would be cool to do that with you at some point, Caradog. Uh, not necessarily on. Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously, I doubt that you're looking to do that on your computer, but whatever, we could we could collab because uh, collab mm. bro or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. I I don't know how I feel about water cooling. Hmm. Like, certainly not hardline because it. <sighs> I feel like I'd need to be in the position where I already have two other computers kind of thing, just because it's having having this computer be fully water-cooled, even though it's soft tubing, mm. it's been a pain because it's, yeah, it's just been a hassle. Is this and, just like maintenance? Because when you want to take something in or out, you're just like, oh, time to drain it, kind of thing. Well, no. I just, you know, abuse the hoses. But... Fair enough, yeah. That's the advantage. Well, that's the advantage of soft line, isn't it? So, 
Yeah, you know? exactly. But it's it's kind of a case of um, it leads me on to the other thing of I hate M2 drives. I hate where they're placed on motherboards. Why are they positioned underneath the graphics card? If I have the money and the interest in using an M2 SSD, I'm also going to have a dedicated graphics card. Why is it mounted so I can't take it out without removing my graphics card? There's kind of nowhere else to put it. However, put I will... Put it on top of the slot and move the slot down. Uh, yeah, you could. What yeah. the two around? I mean, especially now SLI is dead. Um, because right now, um, just just for say, I'm just going to give people a... Let's uh, go. Whee! I'm going to go over to here to the recording computer. So, uh, yeah, so right now, like on a typical computer, the top slot is either missing or unused. So your top PCI plate is always empty and your graphics card occupies two and three. Um, so yeah, really, especially given that SLI is kill on any serious gaming computer, SLI is dead. There's really no reason why you can't just put the P the primary PCI Express 16 slot another notch down and go three and four, and that would give you room for two M2s above the graphics card. I'd agree or with that. Put the M2 in slot one and the GPU in slot two. As in, um, don't have a 1x slot at the very top, like yours currently does. Replace that 1x with the M2. Well, there's already an M2 there on the vast majority of motherboards. But it's then an awful lot of them get covered up by graphics cards then. Well, certainly at least in the two that I've, three that I've dealt with, my MSI one and my two gigabytes. Interesting. It's GPU, it's GPU slot here. Hmm. Then um, SSD there. Why don't oh, you the, do the vast that? vast majority of motherboards, the primary M2 slot is above the graphics card. So I think you might have a couple of oddball motherboards that have very high graphics cards in them. Just like, um, just, 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 just swap yeah. them. However, just I definitely agree. That, I definitely agree that you could probably get two M.2s above the graphics card by shunting the graphics card down another notch. Um, however, yeah. I'll see that and I'll raise you a really terrible habit that some of the motherboard manufacturers are currently in. Um, definitely Asus and some of the MSI boards that I've worked with recently, where the top M2 slot that is above the graphics card, the heatsink for that screws onto the edge of the PCH heatsink, which means you have to remove the graphics card in order to remove that heatsink. So even though the M2 drive is above the graphics card, you still have to take the graphics card out in order to take out the M2 drive. So That's that, so I think, would actually melt your brain. I think you would That's actually so throw dumb. that out the window. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so dumb. The other thing that really, really, really annoys me is when they have 16x length slots. Yeah. And the top one and bottom one aren't the ones that are the CPU ones. It's mm. the top one and the one immediately next to it that's only one slot away from it. So if you were to occupy both of them, you couldn't if you had yeah. more than a single width card. How many graphics cards are single slot width? Yeah. Single slot width died in 2009. I definitely think that they... Yeah, I definitely think there's mileage to... Uh, yeah. Uh, like, a lot of people talk about number of PCI Express lanes and stuff like that, but... Like I, I haven't really done a huge amount of motherboard reviews recently, but I do feel like there's a lot of interest in actually talking about the physical layout of a board. I'm looking over yeah. here because I'm just looking at the motherboard next to me just to get ideas where, yeah. you know, the choice of where they've put the high lane count slots. Um, because again, like uh, some of the typical add-in cards that we would use these days might be an add-in card for either a PCI Express SSD or um, a an add-in card for additional M.2 SSDs. Uh, or you might be using a high-end capture card um, because some of the top-end, you know, a top-end capture card might want, well, is going to at least want 4X and could be mm. looking for 8X. Uh, and it yeah, your, your other ATEX slot is directly underneath your graphics card, which is a slot that you don't want to use because that's where you want airflow. So, yeah. hmm. And it just, it just, 
I never understood why stuff is laid out specifically the way it is. Yeah. Um, I think it's because no one's ever when, really addressed if you're it. Actually, if you're going to actually use the slots for the performance components that you'd have to be occupying those slots, mm. you're not going to want to occupy the slots because you have performance components that need airflow. Yeah. It's just like, what? Yeah. Uh, again, I think it's just based on... I think it's habitual where um, just, yeah. you know... Uh, a lot of stuff is laid out a certain way because that's just how people expect to see it. And I think that's probably yeah. one of the reasons why, you know, no one has thought to put two N.2 uh, slots above the graphics card. Like, from a technical standpoint, I see zero reason why you can't do that. However, I defy any motherboard manufacturer to have the balls to actually do it. Certainly if it was, because the other thing they could do is they could make it so it's just 161 millimeters apart. Mm. Because, or well, 160.5 millimeters apart. So you can dual mount SSDs with a single screw down in the middle in mm. the space of effectively 110 millimeter SSD. Yeah. And then you have one of them support 110 millimeter SSD. Either in both of them will obviously support 110 millimeter. You just depend on which side you're running it from. Yeah. So it's like that's kind of the thing. It's you could you could double up that the usage of that area by just mounting two opposing. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Um Antonio Lambraca or Lambranza. Sorry if I'm butchering your name. Thank you very much for the fiver. The M.2 idea is great, but not in small builds as it won't allow any airflow for the GPU. Uh, yeah, this wouldn't work on this wouldn't work on ITX or micro ATX. This I think this would definitely be on an ATX thing. Um, but like for I've a also not used micro ATX I'll, or ATX yeah, for was, anything ever. I think when you when you're working down in a compact case, that is just one of the cons as soon as you're working in any compact build, so micro or smaller you're immediately going into the land of Tetris anyway, where to get to you have to take yeah. things out to get to other things. That's just the way that that, that small form factor works. Yeah. If uh, I was building small a form factor... ATX, think, it's, it's generally... Exactly. Yeah. ATX is generally assumed that you have full access to everything in the case at all times. So, yeah. Yeah. It's also it's also the other thing for me that makes it most annoying is that we, we had this be a non-issue by using SATA. And then we had mm. the perfect replacement for that with U2. I like M.2 because there's no cables. I, I understand what you're saying there. Um, it's just to me, it's the fact that it was it was never both. Yeah. I, I can understand having a single least... M2 slot, then having two additional U2 slots. Mm. So if you want to have more PCI Express storage, you run them on a U2 slot and they just go into your front bay. Yeah, that makes sense to me because yeah. it covers both off. You're reducing the number of cables for most builds that require a single yeah. drive, and then for the people who want extra storage, they have the convenient f factor. Yeah, and also it means you also get access to significantly faster, well, more workstation e drives becoming yeah. more available at mainstream. And I'm not talking about on your £200 X570 board. Yeah. I'm talking about the four £500 X570 boards that I buy. Yes, agreed. I realise that the category I'm buying at doesn't apply to, again, to most people. Yeah, but that's but what, kind that's of what makes expensive. those boards expensive, is they have exotic I'm, connectors like you two yeah, exactly. that the average I'm buying person a, doesn't use. Yeah, I'm buying a £300, £400 motherboard. I kind of expect it to have U.2. Mm. Yeah, and, I'd agree like, with that. Those slightly more workstationy bits on it, so I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. TX yeah. Envoy, thank you very much for the dollar. You have the AIO water cooler installed wrong. It should be sticking out of the case. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's also something I've <laughs> never quite followed. Mm. Is why on like ultra compact PC cases. Yeah. They don't give you the option to mount to the outside of the case. So, like, have a, ho um, a hose hole for you to go through. So yeah. it's a case of if you wanted to go for that aesthetic, you could go for the mounted on the outside I think cables that would be and cool. tubes going everywhere look. A build that I wanted to do, um, one, of my, one of my old... Uh, the last time I was building small form factor, I had a low-profile case. 
Um, and one of the things that I really wanted to do with that, but I never did because I I couldn't afford, I didn't have the money to achieve it because it would have required buying very expensive parts that I would be doing just for the sake of it. It didn't make sense. But what I wanted to do is have, um, I had seen uh, someone who made passive radiators. So they um, they didn't, like a normal radiator um, is more like yeah. a heater matrix. So you have, you know, your core with the tanks at both ends and fans blowing through it. This were, these were passive radiators where you had sort of just color, star-shaped columns um, that were just designed to radiate um. heat in all directions. And they were sort of squares or, you know, various sizes. And I wanted to have my small form factor case that would have been about sort of that big and have a radiator bolted to the outside of it that was about that big. And because it was it was large but passive, and you'd ha just have a couple of hoses going to the inside, so I'd be able to have a small form factor computer that was custom water cooled and passively cooled by that big, huge passive rad on the outside, which would have looked awesome. Mm. However, like those radiators, I'd have had to buy one and import it from America from a weird custom website, and it would have cost the earth. So I never did it, but I I think yeah. that is a really cool idea that. Lots of people don't really attempt, I don't think. Um, like um, the uh, Reservorator. Yes. Yep. Uh, the the Zalman Reservator. Yep. Um, the the Zalman Reservator. Yeah, and um, Lan 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 Lanley Lan. It was a Zalman. Lanley also did one that had a basically legally legally distinct from but actually identical to naming didn't oh they? i hadn't seen that one yeah no i haven't seen that uh the only other um oh the only other external water cooling solution i've forgotten who made it it was it was either called it was either called or it was by a company called coolants spelt with a k uh and it was an external box that sat on top of your tower and was had a self-contained water cooling system in it and you would just have the two hoses going into the case to your water blocks and um, the control system radiator fans pump the whole shooting match was all inside this box and that was very cool as well um god i haven't Hopefully. heard yeah that yes but those those were pretty swish um and i, I liked That's... the idea of that as well that's um. an interesting idea. The other thing, of course, which kind of gives you hilariously bizarre other options, as well as obviously the fact that we've got Thunderbolt 3 and 4 now, mm. which are basically just direct PCI links. Yeah. So you can have, you know, just your graphics cards separately and then yeah. your computer. Yeah. I mean, it. There's two th lines of thinking because modular is cool and everyone loves the idea of a modular computer, which is why we keep seeing stuff like um, uh, Razer have got one. Like Razer, Razer have a modular computer where you have this tower with modules that connect onto the front and back, like a power supply module, a CPU module, GPU module, and yeah. so on and so forth. It's got a code name and every now and then someone posts it going, oh, wow, look at this. I'm like... It's been around for six years. They're never going to make it. They've yeah. got they've got a prototype of it somewhere. They'll never build it. It's a terrible idea, and I'm not going to go into yeah. it. Um, however, it's the concept is cool. However, mm. the other thing is is that like we already have really modular computers. You can swap in and out all kinds of parts to an ATX computer yeah. at your will, and. Why do we want things to be external when we have a case to put everything inside so it's all self-contained into a single box that you can pick up? So yeah. we, we've got this sort of, we want stuff to be external so you can interchange it, but it's already really easy to in interchange anyway. So you've got to wrestle those two conflicting ideas. Certainly for me, having the sort of interconnects being like um, Thunderbolt 3 or 4, just the thing that makes that quite good is it obviously means that you could have at home just a graphics card and you yeah. connect that up and that graphics card plugs in directly to your screens and then you just Thunderbolt 3 to your um you yeah. know to your ultra thin laptop. I was gonna say this makes a lot of sense that, for laptops. That makes sense to me yeah. and I like and that. I want that to be affordable as well because right now just like mm. external graphics cards to for laptops are just still 
really freaking expensive and I don't understand why they yeah. cost so much. Like an external graphics card enclosure, it's like three hundred pounds last I checked. Um, Which for, for for one. And kind of seems to be reasonably close to the cost of the bits though. Yeah, but why are the bits so expensive? Because, because all, all all you need is that PCI connection and a power supply and a tin box to put it in. I don't understand why mm. that costs three hundred pounds. You know. Because yeah. it that it's, just it makes it infeasible as far as I'm concerned. It's yeah, it's I, I think it's partially obviously massively niche product. So the margin on it has to be much, much bigger. Yeah. I can because the sales that. volume is so so low. Yeah. So say you're happy to take five percent on another product, you'd have to take probably twenty five percent on that product. Yeah. Yeah. Um so I think I think that that's a lot of it. Also, the fact of because Thunderbolt three licensing, as far as I'm aware, was quite expensive, uh, and obviously it would have to have a reasonably expensive license yeah. to then say that it's Thunderbolt three for it to then be compatible. Yeah, USB four so, is going to fix yeah. that though, isn't it? Is USB four license free? You, 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 mm, 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 mm. I don't know if USB is a th free license or an open yeah. license or not. I don't think USB is an open license, but as far as I'm Hope, aware, it's yeah. a substantially lower cost one. Yeah, if it's at least lower cost, then that would be uh, um, that would be acceptable. Because yeah, as I say, I can understand Thunderbolt having a uh, a license fee just because of the branding associated with it and so on and so forth. Also, um, it just seems to have far greater testing actually performed on it to yeah. say, no, this is actually compatible and no, this is actually a decent quality product. Because yeah. I, I do, I, I love the idea of Thunderbolt. However, it is fundamentally a bit of a mess um, with, uh, with regards to like, I, I mean, we've had this conversation before, but you know, like it's a bit of a mess with regards to type c being sometimes it's thunderbolt and sometimes it's not and sometimes you can have two laptops that are the same model and the inter they both two two identical laptops one of them's amd one of them's intel they both have a type c port the intel one that is a thunderbolt port the amd one it's not a thunderbolt port and it's just like and obviously the intel one because it's thunderbolt that means it can do display output but the amd one is not thunderbolt it's type c which means it's the same connector but it can't do display output and it's just like mm -hmm. It just yeah, like uh, you you and I same, can understand that, but that's, that's the same thing we had with DisplayPort, though. Yeah, because yeah, and the, the, the same problem existed with DisplayPort or or and Thunderbolt with Thunderbolt too. Because like obviously, when I mean initially when we saw Thunderbolt two on Max, you know, it was more or less the uh, it was the first mainstream use of that connector, the Mini DisplayPort connector. Um, that we saw on mass and uh, because it was on a laptop it was Thunderbolt 2 so it had DisplayPort output but then we start seeing that connector on the back of PCs as mini DisplayPort and it's like it looks just like Thunderbolt 2 but isn't Thunderbolt 2 and just yeah, mm. like considering like ev every week I have people who come into my shop who think of USB out as this miracle connector and they're like oh I want to I want to plug my TV into my laptop over USB, and I'm like, no, that's that you can't do that. That's not how it works. But you kind of can do it because you can get these really stupid USB to HDMI graphics cards. So you kind of can, but you shouldn't, and it's well, really confusing it to the market. Yes, I don't know what the answer is mm. specifically just because again it's a case of people conflating a physical connector with the standards that are able to be put through that yeah, connector that's the it's problem. the same as people it's the same as people getting pissed off because an iec lead uh you know a, C, a c13 connector yeah. can take 110 volts at 50 hertz or 240 volts at 60 hertz or it can take Two ni or it can take 268 volts at 50 hertz. It's yeah. the same connector doing three different standards of electricity. I'll give you that. Um, I think that that's a like, connector, and that's a, and that's a and 
it, they're the same connector, yeah. but they're doing different things. But then on and the other hand, kind of, you generally... They're all power standards, yes. But... Yeah. I, I get what you're saying, um, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I, like... it's, it's kind of a case of, I understand the issue that people have. I'm also yeah. saying that, well, yes, the reason you have this, this issue is because you're calling it a connection standard a connector. Yeah, that's when true. When the things are very different things. So yeah. yes, I understand what issues... I understand the issue. I'm also saying that the issue is partially yourself. Yes, this is true. Because you are calling things then, the wrong thing. I mean, it, there's there's so, two yeah. there's two potential solutions to this. Either A, you need to educate people that connectors and standards are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, or B, we need to stop using different standards on the same connector and just eradicate the problem altogether. Um, yeah. And the latter would be wonderful, but probably isn't going to happen. Um, it it so. would be good if for something to be called USB four, it has to dis it has to support every single mode. Yeah, that that would be a good situation. At least, at for least it. a host port has to be able to do that. I'm I'm not asking a device to be able to support all modes. However, a hope uh, because the device um, the device end uh, only has to do what the device is capable of. It has no obligation to be able to achieve anything else. Whereas a host port, I want to be able to plug anything into that. However, mm. like I, I don't need, um, <clears throat> you know, if a, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example here. Um, if I'm plugging in, uh, well, if uh, if I'm plugging in a a, a Type C gamepad, that gamepad doesn't have to support support display connectivity over USB Type C. Because it's not a display, so it has no obligation to support any of those display features. The device doesn't have right. to support. Oh everything. right, okay. Yeah. Whereas the host port, so on the computer, that I believe does have an obligation to be able to do everything that the connector is capable of, because yes. it is. If the connector is on your 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 laptop, then you would assume that you can connect to anything that has that connector to it. Um. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a case that the... Yes, I, I agree. I also think that that applies to, like, your TV. Your TV, if it has USB-C, should support all of the alternate modes for USB-C. If your monitor has USB-C, it should support all of the alternate modes for USB-C. Because it should support that. Either is the display itself doing it, hmm. or pass-through. Or it should be doing uh, it for pass-through. Yeah. Because, okay. because if I connect my computer to my monitor with USB-C, why shouldn't my monitor support passing through that video signal to a yeah. secondary device? Because it's a screen. And kind of things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that depend. Yeah, I think... Uh, yeah, we're... Obviously, we're, we're pushing... I think we're pushing the argument to, a, to an extreme example here. Um, however, and... By that token, I think that that depends on how the monitor is presenting itself. Because, for example, by by the same logic that we're saying here, if a big screen TV has USB Type C on it, obviously a one such mode of USB Type C is power delivery. Uh, yeah. But do I expect to be able to power a big screen TV off of my laptop? No, I don't expect it to be capable of doing that. So, but it depends. But, if a screen requires less than sixty-five watts, you should be able to. Oh, it could be able to. Yeah. However, I'm I'm That's saying, saying. A, I'm saying a big screen is the yeah. limit. Is I'm, the I'm limit saying of... a big screen TV to try and make something big and overpowered mm. to to try and yeah, blow absolutely. this out of proportion. I'm, I'm not saying that the standard should be changed yeah. so that I can just I can pull two hundred watts through this USB thing yeah. because because reasons. I'm saying that all of the things in the currently defined standard should be able to work through all of the yeah all would, of the host devices i th i think though the conflict of this discussion kind of illustrates the reason why um uh you are correct and we cannot expect uh every connector to support every protocol that might be used on it and stuff like that because mm. The more we look into this, the more we realise that we're being unreasonable by asking anything that has that connector to support all possible modes of that connector. Um, but by I, so, I th I think we need to find this middle ground somewhere where you know we can't have it that everything just blanket supports everything else. But by the same token, I think 
there are plenty of mainstream devices by big name brands that don't have functionality that we would expect them to have, which causes confusion in the market. I do think it's a case that adding in all of the alt modes and stuff like that was a mistake. Mm. It was it was a clever idea, but I don't think it should have been done in the way it was. And it certainly shouldn't have been able to have been advertised yeah. as such, in the sense of it should have been simply a data transfer thing in the same way as USB in in the same way as USB A and USB B were purely data transfer things that also carried power because you needed to power the device that you're transferring data to. Yeah. It should have been an uprated version of that. So we say, you know, we're going to 20 gigabits per second and we're supporting 200 watts. Yeah. 100 watts, 50 watts. That's as... it. It's doing the power delivery and it's doing data as in USB data. And that's it. Yeah. And simply adding in a new connector that does that, with that being the Type-C reversible connector that snaps off a lot less easily than Micro-B does, mm. would have resolved that issue. Yeah. As Teltac said, the majority of this is a marketing issue. So, yeah, yeah it is. Also, a... the thing that would be really, really nice is if it was a requirement of the USB standard for USB 3 ports, the first Gen 1, so mm. 3.0 Gen 1, to be dark blue, and then everything else to be like light blue or teal. Yeah. You didn't get yellow USB ports. What the hell's a yellow USB port? Because technically in the standard, that means it supports fast charging. Yeah. And fast charging under the standard of yellow USB ports means it supports 10 watts. Yeah. Hmm. Not fast charging as in Qualcomm fast charging or warp charging as in from Xiaomi. Yeah. Or any of those things. So whatever, it's just like or whatever Huawei's one is, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's Huawei uses Qualcomm Quick Charge 3 as far as I'm aware. No, it doesn't. because uh, oh, my, my Huawei all of mine have. Really? Oh. Yeah. My... Well they certainly support it, at least. I'll need because I've only got I've only got a QC three charger and my fast charge is via QC three. I'll have to test my P twenty. Uh, my, my P twenty definitely doesn't because I've got a QC three charger in the shop and my P twenty doesn't fast charge from it. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So because I, I was about to say because that's a source of annoyance for me. But then also uh, then there's the other thing of what's the difference between when the phone says it's fast charging and when it says it's quick charging. I. Fucking wish phones would tell you what charging they're actually doing. Because yeah, but this we're gonna like, get we're gonna get into another rant here. We're gonna get into another rant. It's just so, delightfully terrible. Yeah, just the fact of can you actually just give me the words? Can you actually give me the numbers? Yeah, just give me the volts. Give me the amps. Just give me the not watts. necessarily not on the main screen. Yeah, not like the standard customer facing screen. But allow me to go settings battery. Battery charging, advanced information, charging speed. Yeah. So I can confirm uh, that the phone isn't fucked, or the, that the yeah. charger isn't at, at the very least broken. on 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 your phone when it says char when your phone says charging on the lock screen, it could just have what wattage it is charging at, because like the average person, yes, they don't know what a watt is. However, uh, more watts equals charging faster. Whereas mm. higher volts or higher amps, it depends because it you know obviously the two go hand in hand and you'd need both numbers for that to be have any meaning at all. And once you put both oh. numbers there, that's confusing. However, more watts equals faster charging. You know you can a, an average person can understand that if they plug in their phone and it says charging twenty watts, it's charging faster than when it says charging ten watts. So. Yeah. That could be an interesting way of naming it. You you don't put any unit on it. You just call it fast charge five, fast charge ten, fast charge fifteen, charge fast charge eighteen point five. And you just write that. So you don't yeah. add a unit into it. You don't particularly confuse people. But any of the people who care will very quickly go, Oh, I connected to a standard charger and it says fast charge five. That's probably what's. Yeah. Oh, I've just connected it to a supercharger and it says fast charge one fifty. That's hundred and fifty watts. Yeah, a part of me is just like, wait, what? But uh, there's not a doubt in my mind that there's a phone out there that can do that. So, there is. Yeah. 
Is it is it a hacking one plus? I I can't remember. It's one of the yes. stupid one pluses that requires a cooling fan when it's charging on at full tilt, isn't it? Ugh. Uh, it's still right. just the fact that I still uh, I was just thinking about that, and I was just like, oh no, that means it fast charges faster than the lipo charger I have. It is a lipo charger for like drones and stuff. Yeah. Also, this is like, oh. um, Rumbarak uh, says, uh, this is why I hate that all batteries have their capacity in milliamp hours on it, not watt hours or joules. Absolutely agreed. M- milliamp hours is a meaningless number unless yeah. you also account for the cell count. And yeah. uh, again, it's just that lots of people, even lots of technical people, don't understand why their phone says that it has a 5,000 milliamp hour battery while their laptop says 4,700 milliamp hours. And they're like, how can the phone have a bigger battery than my laptop? I don't understand that. And it's like, because the cell count is different. Yeah. Um, whereas watt hours completely eliminates that. I really wish we could all just switch over to measuring battery capacity in watt hours. Because again, that's an absolute number. Because generally speaking, people don't need to know what the cell configuration of the battery is. They just need to know an actual useful capacity measurement. Yeah, this is, this is a rant stream now. I can't <laughs> think of why anyone who isn't trying to do something other than just use it needs to know. Because if you're buying a replacement one, well, actually, what if you're buying a replacement battery for something? You'd need to know. You'd need to know all three. Arguably. Yeah, I mean, you could write that on the so, label, um, but I I'm, don't. I, mean, but I don't know. Yeah, but also, I mean, obviously, it's... if I if I take a on a on a laptop battery, you know, like when when I'm when I'm buying the laptop, you would say it has a sixty watt hour battery. However, if I'm replacing the battery, then I'm going to look at the technical specifications where it actually says fourteen point eight volts. Yeah, and oh, typically this one actually has the watt hours written on it because most laptop batteries do actually have watt yeah. hours written on them. Um, yes. However, also, I think the other problem is though it's harder for marketing. Because obviously, if you take a traditional laptop battery, it's what 12, 14, 16 watt hours, something uh, in that order. No, this, you know, this the is the little this, thick ones. This is a peasant tier. Um, this is a peasant tier HP battery. It's a four cell, so it's not a it's not a really awful three cell battery. They're out there, um, uh, but yeah, this is forty one watt hours. So it's you know even the even the okay yeah but even that's... a small battery has a decent okay. amount of kick in it. That's... 40 though if you yeah. sell it in milliamp hours it's 5000 and 5000 is significantly better than 40 uh, i hate that you're right but you're right it's the same reason why we still measure like why why do we measure in milliamp hours when everything is in the thousands anyway like e- yeah. e- like amp hours would make a lot more sense you know mm. like yeah e- even even a low capacity like this is a four cell lipo battery uh, this is um, 14.8 volts, 1300 milliamp hours. Like, why not just say it's 1.3 amp hours? Why do we need the thousands? But I would agree that that is a marketing thing. So I hate that you're right, but you're right. Yeah. So that's that's what it is. Yeah. I think however, it's, yes. And it's um, yeah, it's a shame. But it is mostly a marketing thing, as far as I can tell, as to why it stays like that. It just annoys me that the semi-technical press doesn't call it out all of the time yeah. and just go, no, we're calling this a 5 amp power external battery. I no, think we're that's... calling this a 10 amp power external battery. Yeah. As opposed to writing it as 10,000 milliamp hours and then me sort of sitting there and going, yeah. wait, oh no, that is the right number of zeros. I, I think it's because a lot of them don't understand how battery cell configurations work. Um, and yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, because I, I can't remember who I was watching. I was watching one of the mainstream YouTubers. It might have been Linus Tech Tips. It might have been Jay Seuss. I can't remember what it was. But they said something about... Um, they, they said... Um, oh, yeah, that's right. It was uh, I was watching the Linus Tech Tips video about that... Uh, that big portable battery pack that they that they had yeah. on uh, recently, and at some point, I think it was Linus who said, "Oh, it's a five thousand milliamp hour battery, which doesn't sound like much. Like I've got that in my phone, but trust me, it's got a lot of capacity in it." And in that moment, I was like, "You don't know what that means, do you?" And uh, like, I could be wrong. Maybe it's just because he was reading from the script and hadn't thought it through because he's reading the script. 
and, di- and he probably didn't write that script or something. But in that moment, I was like, you just said 5,000 milliamp hours with zero comprehension of what that number actually means. It's also the case that I don't know if you've noticed it, hmm. but I have that this, the, the sort of three quarters of 2020, hmm. the the level that the videos are aimed at has gone down a notch. Mm. The assumed knowledge is lower, and the sort of speaking age is aimed at a lower, at a slightly lower tier. Mm. I presume because they they realised that they were starting to lose the very mainstream audience, and they have to they have to capture that audience. Yeah, because obviously they have to get a million views in the first day. Sort yeah. of thing. I don't get me wrong. I'm. Um. This isn't a bash, and like I, I sympathise with uh with the big channels that have to play the clickbait game. You know, I really yeah. sympathise that because they know they're doing it and they hate doing it, but they have to do it, and mm, I sympathise exactly. with that issue. However, I feel it, but. What where I'm getting at here is that in that moment, I think that Linus genuinely didn't understand what the difference between a 5,000 milliamp hour one cell battery uh, and the battery pack, which obviously would have been a multi cell battery. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, because again, like uh, this this battery here, you know, 1,300 milliamp hour battery. That sounds pretty small. Like a, a five thousand milliamp hour back phone. That's five times the capacity than this, right? Hell no. This is a four cell battery. This is four mm. mobile phone batteries strapped together. Um, mm. So that is what makes it high. So yeah, and it's not that complicated um, either. And but I th- and I think that's why it surprises me. So. Yeah, as I, said, I'm, I keep drifting off topic here, but my point is, I think the reason why a lot of this misleading marketing is there and use of the wrong terms is there is because a surprising number of tech people do not understand how battery cell configuration works. Um, yes. and Or, or yeah. have little interest in it, perhaps. And I know this as well because, like, maybe it was too dry, but one of the... Uh, I did a mini-series on my channel called How to Lipo, uh, and the playlist yeah, for that is on the home screen of my channel. And, or if you check the Adamant IT playlists and look up the How to Lipo playlist, I've got a playlist with several videos in that go into morbid detail about cell configuration and what the numbers mean and how and just a crash course on on how lipo batteries are configured. Mm. And you know, it's not it, you know like it it it's not a university course. It's me dicking around with with batteries. However, just that level of information will give you a vastly greater understanding of batteries than just simply, I don't understand why 5,000 milliamp hour phone battery is smaller than 4,000 milliamp hour laptop battery. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. So yes, it's, yes, I, I do think that a lot of the the labeling confusion does ultimately come from the advertising department. Yeah, who on obviously the advertising department almost certainly have no idea what the numbers mean as well. So, not, yeah. Yes, and not just that, just the bigger number is better. So we must yeah. use the biggest number we can to sell this, whether it's the most useful number or not, as long as it's still not something we can be caught out for for lying, we need to use the bigger number. Yeah. And... Um... Yeah, I mean, that, that, and that's that's a culture problem um, that I want us to get past. I want us to get past that issue of wanting to do bigger numbers better in the same way that I despise the uh, the 99p or the 99 cents price tag saying, oh, it's not it's not one pound or one dollar or, you know, it's it's not ten dollars. It's nine ninety nine because nine ninety nine looks and sounds smaller than ten dollars. And it bothers me. I understand why it works, but I hate it to my core. And I want us as a culture to stop thinking that way. Um, uh, that yeah, requires I, people to stop thinking like people. Yeah, I, I, I get and it. People, I get and people, it, but people, I still dislike people, it. People, 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 and it's hard <laughs> to stop people peopling. Yeah. Urgh. It's the same reason why one can say brains, bra- don't, brains don't always brain like brains brain, but brains do brain quite yeah. often. And brains can brain what I'm saying about brains braining. Yes. <laughs> it's the fact that those con those 
constructs function is the reason why this doesn't work. So yeah, yeah, it's it's a very difficult problem, and I don't think you're, we're going to solve it. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Dude, you need to solve people being people. Yeah. Hmm. Right. Oh dear, that suddenly sounded like eugenics. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, on Wait, that bombshell, no. I'm going to jump back into chat. Um, Russell Turner just linked uh, okay. uh, just linked a, a, a device from Aqua Computer. There's another brand that I haven't seen in a long time. Aqua Computer used to be all the rage. They probably still are in certain spaces. I'm just not on the scene. Um, but yeah, they've got uh, the Airplex Gigant Aluminium Lamenlin. I can't speak. Uh, German, but it's a big external radiator that looks kind of neat. Sorry, uh, however, Lemon it's also I, I'm not going to try and pronounce it again. However, it's also 550 euros. Good grief! So, yeah, but that's, that, that that's looks... only like a thousand pounds after Brexit, right? <laughs> oh no, but it looks really cool, and it's cool to see your, that this stuff exists. So, that's pretty rad. Um. Uh, I'm going to scroll down and see what's on the first page of stuff yeah, again. Absolutely. Oh, someone someone asked which headphones I'm using, and I'm using the Bear Dynamic DT770 Pros. Yes, Pros. Yes, the Pros, the two uh, the two fifty ohm version. I also have the eighty ohm version as well, and I can confirm that there is no difference in the sound. There's just a difference in the difficulty to drive it. Mm. That is it. Huh. Which is kind of exactly what one is expected. Yeah. Mm. For that. So yes. It's um yes. There's a whole there's a whole massive debate that one can have about headphones and impedances and so on. Fair enough. Uh Piero Bonisoli. Easiest way to remove all the Windows 10 bloatware. I want to investigate debloating. And I mean, the, the easy thing is with PowerShell. Yes. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, but I want to investigate an easy way of doing it that is not... Because the difficult... The, the, this is a really interesting topic that I need to do a lot of research on to actually give a comprehensive answer to. Because... Um, so firstly, yes, it is true. There is a lot of bloat in Windows 10 in terms of stuff that is installed by default or running by default that does not need to run by default on most systems, but is there just in order to cover all the bases. Um, because obviously the reason why it's there is that they want it to, you know, they want the system to be a one size fits all where you can plug yeah. in almost any device and it will just work um, yeah. without any hassle. That, so that's why it's all there. Like, for example, all of the touchscreen functionality and handwriting recognition runs by default on Windows 10. And for everyone with a gaming PC, they're like, why the hell would I want that? But of course, mm. touchscreen laptops are a thing. Um, mm. So what would be nice is if Windows was a little bit more discerning about going, hmm, there's no touchscreen connected to this device, so we're just going to turn off all of the touchscreen support. That would as be nice. far as I'm aware, hmm. in Windows 10, an awful lot of that stuff is far, far better segmented than it ever was before. Yeah. And just doesn't do anything unless you're actively calling it. Yeah. I think as Windows, far as I'm aware, Windows, Windows 10, is... 10 is far better at having stuff installed and hmm. it not doing anything. Yeah. I think it's better than previous versions of Windows. So it's better than people give it credit for when compared to certainly like uh, Windows 7 and 8. However, Windows 10 uh, also looks very bloated because like 10 years ago, um, and well, even as recently as five years ago, when I was servicing computers running like Windows 7, one of my gauges for how well I had serviced the computer was how far I had reduced the idle process count on the computer. Mm. And I was trying to, like for me, if a computer came in, I would turn it on, I would go into Task Manager, and I would see how many processes are running. And a computer that's a bit of a mess would have like 110 processes on it. And I'd be like, whoa, that's why it's so slow. And I would uninstall or uh, or disable anything that didn't need to be there. 
until we got down to like less than 70. And obviously the lower the yeah. better. Back in the Windows XP days, you could drive that number down to um, down to 15, 10, even below 10 if you went real extreme and went full strip out. Um, and uh, however, these days, you open up a typical Windows 10 computer, you'll have 200 processes running. So you look at that and you go, whoa, look at all this bloat. But the other thing to remember is that on Windows 10, uh, as Caradog pointed out to me at one point, they've segmented out so much um, that lots of uh, lots of uh, system services that used to all run under a single process now mm. run under three small processes instead of one big one, with the idea yeah, being absolutely. that Windows 10 can switch off individual processes better. And also, if one yes. of those processes go down, it doesn't kill that entire stack of services. Yeah. Because on Windows 7, there are a um, uh, classic one. On Windows 7, svchost.exe. And if you go Googling for oh, that, yeah. you'll find a billion pages of people going, SVC host is broken. SVC host is service host. It's the executable that runs a service. And on Windows 7, yeah. it's quite common to see an SVC host instance that is running like 10 services. And you cannot... Uh, so obviously, it's incredible. If one of those services goes down, it kills the entire service host instance and knocks everything out. So the thing is, Windows 10 is not actually as bloated as people think it is. It just looks bloated because it's been... Uh, it has been modularized a great yes. deal more. Um, also, I get the feeling hmm. that um, part of it, obviously having everything split out with m many more threads in it, yeah. means that it works better with 16 core oh, yeah. processes. Yes, that is stuff. true. I would assume that is a 100% assumption. Yeah, but I that, would presume I would by the fact that, that there are more services and more threads and things there mm. that they can be shuffled around onto the different cores better. Yeah. So yes. Um, and and also, I would say... Current continue. I was just going to say the other thing that is obviously the case of there's a difference between debloating, talking about all of the Windows features that are built in, mm. and buying a pre-made computer and all of the junk that comes with that. Oh, yes, that's the true. First one, the first one is kind of a case of it's... Uh, there's an argument to be had that it isn't bloat. Yes. The second one, there's very much an argument to say, can any of this be described as useful? Agreed. Uh, for example, and it's a case if, of if you it depends a... on what conversation they're going down. Yeah. Um, and sometimes um, the, the preloaded software can be actively harmful, like Lenovo computers. All of, on a Lenovo computer, all of the Lenovo brand software is garbage and quite often will be doing massive damage to reliability and performance. If you have a Lenovo, if you buy a Lenovo laptop, the first thing you should do is take it out of the box and erase it and do a clean vanilla it's install Windows. of Windows. Yeah. I mean, I recommend doing that with any laptop. However, Lenovo even more so. Dell are one of the lowest offenders for this. Uh, Dell computers, by comparison, have far less ch uh, junk on them by default. But yeah, that's that. Um, so... Um, I'm also seeing, which is very interesting, Noel Dowds has said there's a Windows 10 ISO bare bones from Microsoft with no crap in it. I'd be very interested to take a look at that. We've got a link that's come out. Is Have you just checked that, um, Caradog? That link is the one for the Windows Media Creation tool, which is the, well, that's the vanilla raw version. Windows install, yeah. which is the case of obviously that is the addition of Windows that Microsoft expects people to run. Yeah. So if you start running variations from that, you you effectively don't have support. Yes. Obviously, that's the, that's the thing to be aware However, of. However, Noel Dowds is implying that there is an official bare bones version from Microsoft.com. Like, what what do you like? I'd be if that exists, I would be very interested to look at it and see what's not there. Um, mm. uh, so the other t the other kind of bloat, like the kind of bloat that I remove from a Windows 10 install, is. Um, uh, mainly just modern apps because a lot of the modern apps don't really need to be there and because the modern apps get updated in the background that has a large contribution to just idle time on the computer um, I have you know both me and Caradog have discovered that on Windows 10 if you actually strip out all the modern apps 
you actually get a significant improvement in performance because Windows is never spending time trying to update them. And well, this, this on can have very low end devices. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, on anything on, that's on a gaming at a PC. Yeah, on a gaming PC, you've got so much horsepower that this is a completely irrelevant discussion. On any machine that is actually of a standard that I'd be comfortable giving to someone to use, it mm. makes no difference. Yeah, we're talking about things which have AMD C sixes in, with a thirty two hundred RPM drive in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's where it makes differences, yes. Or if you've but, got a hard drive as well, you know, that that it can help because obviously you get a oh, lot yeah. of you get a lot of idle scratching. So yeah, again, yeah. if you have an SSD okay. and stuff like that, it's yeah. But yeah. then on the other hand as well, a lot of people want to de bloat not necessarily because they think they'll get an actual performance increase, but because they just want it to be tidy and stripped out mm -hmm. and they they want to just trim the fat because it makes them feel better about it and i can mm -hmm. i can relate to that as well um and so yeah, from that there are various de bloat scripts out there however i yeah. am really really wary about them for two reasons the first reason is microsoft fiddles with the default installation of windows on almost every build update so your debloat software has to be optimized for the version of Windows 10 that you're actually going to run. So whether you've got 1909, 2004, 20H2, it needs to be optimized for that because I have previously, at one point in the earlier days of Windows 10, I was making my own debloat script. However, a new build of Windows came out that had a completely different set of modern apps installed. And suddenly my script that removed all of the modern apps was completely out of date and had to be updated and stuff like that. And the other thing as well is that people have different definitions of what is bloat and what is not bloat. And sometimes you can get rid of something that doesn't seem necessary, but then you get weird problems down the line. And case in point for that yeah, was at yeah. one point I debloated my Windows install on my home PC and where I was doing this manually by disabling services and stuff like that, which is how I always used to do it in the old days. Um, and I had gone through and I had disabled loads of network services that weren't relevant to me and like the Xbox services, because I'm just like, I don't own an Xbox. I don't need any of that running. I play Steam games. And then um, one day I found I was having issues. Like when I wanted to play Sea of Thieves with my friends, I couldn't join Sea of Thieves games where people either could people couldn't invite me or I couldn't ex I they would invite me and I wouldn't receive the invite link and things like that mm. and I just like all of that stuff was just broken beyond belief and it was because oh. the Xbox live services were not there and then I enabled those and then they wouldn't connect because they were relying on some network subservice that I disabled and stuff like that and it was an enormous yeah. amount of hassle to get that all working. And I think in the end, I shortly after that, I reinstalled Windows because I was like, I don't know what else I might have disabled that is now a gremlin in the system. And so this is the issue is a lot of these debloating stuff may have been made by some guy who was just like, I don't play video games. Get rid of all this Xbox rubbish. And not realizing that they're actually going to completely break games for Windows. So... This is the thing is it's very it, this is why the subject of debloating is actually a great deal more complicated than people think it is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, our Windows 10 thing, Enterprise is the strip out version. The thing I've used or the thing I do if I'm doing anything like that is uh, just, you know, that PowerShell script that yeah. removes everything except for the store. Yeah, again, that one you've got to use with a little bit of caution. I mean, now we've got it so it doesn't remove the store. Yeah, that's good. I know the first time I tr the first time I ran a PowerShell script that removed all modern apps, my computer immediately felt faster, but also I didn't have the app store. And also I didn't have stuff like calculator and things like that. And it was, again, you don't, sometimes you don't realize exactly the, the scope of what your debloating is. However, yeah, certainly removing everything bar the store is probably an interesting. But then also, again, you're going to you you may find yourself dropping a load of Xbox Live uh, apps that are required as well. So mm, absolutely, it's what I do. Um, what I do is I do that to uninstall of Windows Ten apps. Mm. 
um, every now and then, just to see what stuff, if anything, it breaks. Yeah. As yeah, well. That's a fair um, point. And I've noticed that the Xbox stuff has gotten much better at saying, oh, this isn't installed. Please install this from the App Store yeah. so I can make function. Microsoft has been doing a lot of work to the Xbox apps in Windows, probably because yeah. of, obviously, uh, game... Um, uh, Xbox... Um, what's the... Oh, Game Pass. Xbox Game Pass is one of Microsoft's major strategies at the moment. Mm. Oh, and absolutely. so, obviously, yeah. they want the Windows experience for... X, for um, uh, Game Pass to be much better. So yes, they have been doing yes. a lot of really good work to the Xbox stuff. Just a quick thing to mm -hmm. cut in is, um, so yeah, Noel Dow's confirmed that the Enterprise version is the no bloat version, which makes sense. Teltac, you say Enterprise isn't really for personal use. Two questions. Number as far one, as it doesn't have DirectX in it. Ah, I was I was about to say number one. Can I run Enterprise with say a Windows Pro license? I, no. I wouldn't. Okay, you have to have a specific enterprise. You have to license. buy an enterprise license. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that that kills it dead. And then the second thing is, um, why wouldn't you want to use it on a personal computer? What is it missing? And if it doesn't have DirectX, yeah, that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of a game changer as well. And so, because why do you need a work PC to play games? Kind of it, thing. Precisely. And yeah, that leads us back to the issue of. Uh, some people have different di definitions on what debloating is. If you're not a gamer, then you'd be like, "Why would I want DirectX?" But if you play PC games, oh, kind you mean of important. So you can use a mouse. <laughs> well, yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I'd imagine it has. Uh, I'd imagine when we say no DirectX, that could be. Um, there's all kinds of DirectX. It probably has some kind of cut down version. Like I'd wager yeah. you need DirectX to run the Windows desktop. But um, as far as I'm aware, Enterprise also still has things like Candy Crush and Bubble Pop and stuff get auto installed to it. So it's kind of oh really? I was going to say because yeah. that's the that's the first that when I'm debloating, I keep using air quotes because debloating has different meanings. Um, the first thing I do is I open the Start menu and I go down most of the modern apps and I go right click uninstall. And it's those it's those free games like Candy Crush and stuff like that. That's the bloat that a lot of people see, and they go, "Look, it's bloated." When it's just like, oh, just right click and uninstall it. Who cares? You know. Mm. In the same way that people say sort of, "Oh, Windows 10 is full of adverts and stuff like that." It's like the only advert I've ever seen on Windows 10 is suggested apps on the Start menu, which is a setting you can turn off in settings. Um, so I think a lot of people that talk about debloating and stuff like that, I think they're blowing the pro the problem out of proportion. Um, Possibly. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, oh, Oath, Pol Oath Politics says no games on Enterprise unless you install them. I'd have to have a look at it. But then, as I say, if you need a specific Enterprise license, that kind of that that's kind of a deal breaker straight away because a lot of people a won't have an Enterprise license and b uh, I'd imagine an enterprise license is either horrifyingly expensive, or you need to have volume licensing for it, which is obviously it's how it's volume intended. Volume license only. Yeah, I would assume it's volume license only. Yeah, so either way, um, it's, it's very much a case of it's not as simple as just downloading the ISO. Uh, and obviously, it does I'd have imagine... ninety day. It does have a ninety day um, DSM window. Yeah. Yeah, and then also, of course, you could also consider the option of either A, just going unactivated, which some people are perfectly fine with, um, yeah. or B, I'm sure there are other ways to solve this problem, but that's not something that I really want to yeah, deal using with. Linux. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that's not something I really want to deal with. Um, so, yeah. Um but yeah, as I say, generally speaking, I don't, th I don't think debloating. It's an interesting topic, and I do want to make a video about it. Uh, however, I need to actually carefully script it so I can have a structured video that covers the the mm. issue comprehensively. Because as I say, there's so many different ways that you can define bloat, and some of it is, yeah, this is stuff that I would want to remove from my PC just for the sake of having a tidy, clean build. Uh, but there's a lot of it that people feel like they want to get rid of, but actually, don't bother, it really doesn't matter kind of thing. So, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think it's also the other case of obviously you could go um, complete extreme the other way and describe having a graphical user interface as bloat. <laughs> yes, this is true. <laughs> you know, it, it's a case of it. The, that's a ridiculous and extreme example for ninety nine percent of people, but it's kind of a case of that's where you could go. Mm. You could you could say, well, you know, everything can be done from the command line, so having a GUI is just bloat. Yeah. But then it's obviously a case you kind of with that you go, well, what then? Why do I really need a graphics card? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. Frag a lot said um, because it's an evaluation version, you could just try it out and see if it works for gaming or content creation. That's actually kind of tempting. I'm actually really mm. tempted because like I've I've got test computers, and like I've got the the my Corsair computer over in the corner of the shop. I'm actually really tempted to download uh, Enterprise Evaluation, stick it on there, install Steam, and try firing up some games and just see what actually works and what doesn't. And just see, and also like do a, com I, I I could do a comparison between Enterprise and uh, Windows Home Vanilla, and actually just see what the idle process count is, what the idle RAM usage is, what works and what doesn't, to actually say, because as I say, that one or two things is going to happen. We're either going to see a noticeable drop in stuff running in the background, and go, yeah, Windows Enterprise is noticeably more stripped out. So if you really care, you could get an enterprise license or we would look at it and both the idle process count and RAM usage and all the rest of it is completely identical. And you could say, look, even in the stripped out enterprise version, it's still the same. So whichever the result is, it would be interesting. So I think, I think that's kind of, I'm, I'm kind of curious about that. And yeah, I could always pick up an enterprise license on eBay, I would imagine, as well. I think the second option oh. as well, or sorry, the, the the other point with that is as well, though, is the case of you'd need to do very strict benchmarking between mm. the two to say, does it even matter? What's the point in caring? Because if the difference you get is one FPS, say, mm. it'll be like, well, that's basically run to run variance. There mm. is no point in using the version that effectively comes with no support and all of that stuff. Yes, true. So, Although when you say support, I ha when was the last time you needed support from Microsoft? That might be unfair, actually, because you work in an office environment. But do you understand what I mean by that? That's No, I don't mean su support in that sense specifically, as in someone specifically answering your questions. It's just a case of your configuration isn't tested. Yeah, like capture cards aren't tested on Windows 10 Enterprise. Yeah, that's true, and that, that and that's that again is the interesting thing is you might we might you might install Windows 10 Enterprise, run up uh, Half Life Two, and it works, and you'd be like, there you go, you can use it for gaming. But then, yeah, if capture cards doesn't work, that's lots of niche little ways in which it can catch you out, and it may actually turn out that this is not fit for purpose at all. So yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. And it's and it's going to be the case that certain, you know, a very specific, um, you know, there might be some very specific situation with a specific combination of your sound driver, your GPU, and the USB webcam you have, meaning your capture card doesn't work. But because none of them are certified for Windows 10 Enterprise, mm. you can't go to anyone and say, actually, you need to fix drivers. Whilst yeah. most people don't do that, it's a case that there is no recourse whatsoever for that because they yeah. never said it would even work. Yeah. And the fact that it does work is but by the grace of God. I mean, straight up example of that would be like when when uh, Windows 2004 came out, um, the capture card that I was using at the time, an LGP Lite, uh, stopped working because of a driver issue. And, um, you know, if everyone was on Windows 10 Enterprise, then uh, Ava Media would turn around and go, we never said it was compatible with Windows 10 Enterprise. We have zero yeah. intention of solving this. There won't be a driver update. And, yeah. and everyone's up the paddle without a creek. Whereas because it's certified to work in Windows, uh, Ava Media were obligated to go back to their driver uh, development and go, oh crap, we need to make a new driver for Windows 2004 that yeah. works and fix this because a load of people bought a product that now doesn't work on a version of it's, Windows yeah. that it is certified to work with. 
So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind, of, it's kind of that situation. And it's, I'm not saying that it won't work. I'm just saying that when you get the fringe cases where it doesn't, you know, the kind of the response is, well, no one said it would. Mm. And I'm not saying that doesn't mean you can't make it work, but it's just a case of, you know, I'm viewing this slightly from the corporate point of view of if this thing says it will work and says it will do this configuration and it doesn't, there's an obligation to fix that. If it doesn't do that, there's absolutely no oblig uh, ab obligation obligation yeah. for that to occur. You know, it can just not function. Mm. And that's it. So it, it's kind of that case of it's it's a very, very low risk, but it's yeah. not a zero risk. Yeah, and it depends true. on what your environment is. Yeah. And so obviously, in a way, if you're a home user, it doesn't matter if nothing works. Because you can just go, oh, reinstall Windows. Hmm. You know, yeah, oh, I'll true. fix that next week. Yeah. It doesn't matter and in the same way. Yeah, I mean, Oath Politics says, never had, a, never had a device working in Windows 10 Pro that doesn't work in Enterprise. And yeah, absolutely. Like, we're, we're talking about a very hypothetical situation here. Um, but again, mm -hmm. it's, it's the hypothetical situation of being stuck with something that doesn't work uh, because they never claimed it would kind of thing. Uh, kind of yeah. like... It's a lot like um, uh, uh, when Windows when Windows 10 came out, there were lots of laptops that were uh, that were uh, sold with Windows 7 um, on them, and the, obviously Windows 10 was a free update from Windows 7. So all those people expected to be able to upgrade to Windows 10, and there are lots of there are more than a few laptops out there that just straight up won't run Windows 10 because mm -hmm. Windows 10 just happens to not have drivers for a particular chipset in that laptop. And yeah. because that chipset is old, the manufacturers are just like, that's old. We're not making new drivers for that. Yeah, exactly. And so that person who has Windows 7 is just like, I'm entitled to a free upgrade to Windows 10, but my device won't run Windows 10. And there's mm -hmm. nothing they can do because their device was never certified for Windows 10. Yeah. Um, so it's a, that's an example. So, a case. Yeah, you're right. We are talking about a hypothetical, but as in, that is a hypothetical of a situation that can and has arisen in yeah, certain absolutely. places. And it's also a case of certainly if you're willing to put the effort in, it's probably a case that you could have installed a fresh install, deleting everything and bodged around with drivers and stuff and made it function but it was a case of obviously that's not a situation that microsoft can advertise they can't do a here's an install that will mostly work maybe you'll probably have to futz around with drivers for six or seven hours mm. you know th they can't sell that s situation it has to 99.9 percent .9 certain work as soon as the upgrade applies yeah 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 Hmm. So yeah, yeah, that's an interesting perspective. And then, yeah, yes. I mean, yeah. I think someone else mentioned sort of oh, you know, um, someone else mentioned oh, sort of pe imagine people caring about bloat when games are a hundred plus gigabytes and stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, there's all kinds of bloat to that perspective as well. I think though, a lot of people want to de-bloat because um, um, just. Uh, to a certain extent, just misinformation. As I said at the beginning of this conversation about bloat and stuff like that, a lot of people just compare like idle process counts and idle RAM usage between Windows 7 and Windows 10. Like a lot of people, they look at Windows 10. Windows 10 on most people's computers, uh, if you like, un unless certainly at 16 gigs of RAM or under, Windows 10 will often just take half the RAM. And we'll just at mm -hmm. idle. We'll just sit at fifty percent RAM usage, and it's not actually using that memory. It's caching. What yeah. it's doing is everything that you use on a regular basis. It's got it loaded up and sitting in RAM. So mm -hmm. if you, when you open, like for example, if you're sitting when you turn on your computer, your Windows will start loading Chrome into RAM, even though you haven't opened it yet, because it yeah. knows that you use Chrome every day. So when you hit Chrome, it will open immediately because it's already in RAM. All Windows yeah. has to go is just like, uh, yes, there you go. And that's yeah. why Windows 10 looks like it's eating so much RAM at idle because it's caching stuff. And older versions of Windows would either cache less 
or not at all. Mm. Um, and so a lot of people they they will op- they'll they'll point to a, like a Windows XP computer and be like, look at that, it's using two hundred uh, megs of RAM at idle. It's like yeah, because XP didn't cache anything. So anytime you wanted to open an app, it had to scrub that out of your hard drive. Um, also, you know, XP didn't have ninety percent of the basic functionality that people use on a computer today. Exactly, exactly. So this is the thing: is a lot of people are looking at older operating systems and going, "Oh, look how little it runs on," and it's not an apples to apples comparison. So mm. a lot of people think that Windows Ten is bloated when, yes, it's a bigger system. But it's also in the same way that, well, going back to the topic of cars, cars weigh more than they used to because there's a lot more stuff in them now. Yeah. However, the reality my... is because they're also more powerful, it doesn't really matter that they weigh more because we've got more horsepower as well. Back in the 70s, your car had maybe 50 horsepower, so it kind of had yeah. to weigh 10 kilograms. Whereas these days, yeah. with any every hatchback running around with 200 brake horse in it, it doesn't matter if a hatchback weighs 1,600 kilograms. Yeah, exactly. But it's like um, my my prime example of that is I haven't done it since I think 1909, but I ran 1909 um, and I was happily using that in a VM with a single core, five five twelve megs of RAM and a like 17 and a half gig virtual drive. Mm. And it was entirely functional. And it was kind mm. of a case of it's possible to do it. Obviously, I was running it on fast components, if that makes sense. I was running it on a modern i3, but a single core. I was yeah. running it on modern fast DDR4 at half a gig of capacity and stuff like that. So it's kind of, you know, all of this stuff functions on fast hardware and you need fast stuff to make it feel fast. But it's a case of the resource usage just idling at desktop and stuff isn't much. Mm. Although I have found an interesting bug with the Windows installer. Yeah. The Windows 10 installer. If you have less than, I think it's 986 megs of RAM, cannot load the EULA. The EULA fails to load. <laughs> oh no. So yeah, for some reason, if you if your RAM avail um if your RAM in a VM dips below that because it's got like dynamic memory, mm. you won't be able to load the EULA. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, thanks, Windows. Yeah, interesting. Um I think I'm gonna go into one more discussion. Well, we'll see how long this one goes for. Earlier on, um uh PC Bolt asked what's the use of cache memory on a hard disk? And another question there of um, have I used Intel Optane and how much performance it improves. These two are very, very closely related. So the first thing, the cache memory on a hard disk, there's two things that this is that this can be used for. Is number one, when let's say you are saving files to your hard drive, your CPU has to process that file and feed the data to the hard drive which will start writing the data as it goes. Now your CPU is occupied giving the data to the drive, which means it can't do anything else. And is occupied until the hard drive says, I have finished writing all of this data, we're finished, you can go and do something else. Now obviously this is an enormous waste of the CPU's time. So what you do is on the hard drive, you have a cache chip, which is very high speed storage but very small in capacity. But the chances are it's big enough to take the whole file that you're going to write to the hard drive. So the CPU can go, here's the entire file, and the hard drive goes, cool, puts it on the cache chip. Now the CPU is finished and can go and do something else while the hard drive sits and writes that file from the from its cache onto the physical drive. So that's the first usage for caching. Um, and uh, uh, print spooling is exactly the same way. Printers will have some onboard RAM, so the the computer can go, here is the file to be printed, and the printer will be like, cool, got it. And now the computer is done and ready to do something else while the printer prints that file off. So again, caching means you have a small amount of local high-speed storage to take the entire job so the CPU is idle and free to go and do something else. So the second thing is to hold recently accessed stuff. 
So whenever you load a file from the hard drive, it will be loaded into the cache and then sent to the computer or the CPU. Now, if the computer then says, I need that file again, the hard drive can then immediately go, cool, it's already in the cache. So it can just blat that file over to the CPU straight away and it doesn't even need to access the physical media. So if for, for files that are being accessed constantly or regularly, they'll be sitting in the cache and you get very high speed access to them. So that is read cache and write cache, which is probably being done on the same chip in most modern systems. But that is what caching is, basically. It's a temporary small high-speed storage. Now, Intel Optane is caching on steroids, essentially. So what you do is you have a modest-sized, very, very low latency SSD. And you have that as an enormous cache in front of slow storage. So rather than having like a couple of megabytes worth of cache, you now have a uh, hundred gigabytes worth of high speed cache. So if you've got like, you know, a hundred terabyte RAID array, you could have a 200 gigabyte Optane cache in front of that. So the 200 gigabytes of recently accessed data that is either being written or has recently been read is cached on super high speed memory, which means the routine stuff is really fast to read and write from the server. And anything that hasn't been accessed for ages because it's archive sits on the physical media. So that is what it's all about. Now, Optane, in my opinion, doesn't make sense on a personal computer. Um, but then also that's because most of the time when you see Optane on a personal computer, you're probably seeing a really crap version of it that's like a 16 gigabyte Optane drive. Most of the laptops I have seen that have the Intel Optane badge on them have just a 16 gigabyte um, M.2 Optane drive in them. And they're sat in front of a ball slow hard drive. Yeah, sat in front of a ball slow hard drive. And it, and it doesn't it, save anything. Yeah, it's more or less, it's the same. It, it's about as good as a hybrid drive, which is not very good. It's a complete it's also waste of the problem it, that a, you've got three types of Optane. Yeah, we'll get to that. Um, and you, those, those kind okay. of laptops, you would be better off just sticking a proper SSD in that M2 slot. It would be a lot better. Um, whereas yeah. on servers, the server Optane stuff, you have a completely different type of Optane that is massively uh, better. Now, the server type of Optane, I understand it's a different animal, but I don't know exactly what makes it different. Do you know mm -hmm. that one, Caradoc? I'm uh, as far as I'm aware. Also, the two the two different things. Um, the Optane memory that you can use as um, that that can go into sodium slots. Yeah, uh, is three D X point memory. Okay, yeah, yeah, which is a special thing made with Micron. Yeah, uh, which gives you an order of magnitude faster than NAND flash, but it's still an order of magnitude slower than DRAM. Yeah, but it's um, but it has, I believe very similar write tolerances to DRAM, so you can effectively infinitely write to it and it won't wear out comparatively, um, but it's much, much higher storage density. Mm. So you can have, you know, um, you can have, what was it? I can't remember, like 48 terabytes of the stuff sat in there. So if you're doing something with, and they say, a ridiculously big SQL database that you want to sit in RAM, mm. it can sit there. Or the other thing you can do with it is you can have it actually appear as storage. Yeah, yeah. And use it as an actual storage. This, Yeah, area. Linus Tech Tips did a video on this one specifically. Yeah. I think this is not quite so, the yeah, version of Optane that we commonly see. Oh, no, 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 um, absolutely. But it's a case of this is a very is, new thing. Spud Nugget but has his hand up, yeah. Um, so... Yeah. Yeah, by all means, um, Spud. If you've got a, if you if you reckon you can cover that in the comments, go for it. Yeah, um, and then there was also just going to be the other thing. There are Optane yeah. storage drives from Intel. Yeah, that are identical to NAND flash SSDs. They're just balls fast. Yeah, I think that's they are the one... standard 
basically the same as a PCI Express SSD. Yeah. They're just way faster because the latency is lower on yeah. reads and writes. They can sustain much heavier workloads without there being, you know, Excessive random spikes wear. in um, delay on uh, read requests or write requests. Yeah. So they are very good at super heavy use cases. Hmm. Um, and, then... and I kind of want one because the price on them isn't actually that much more than like a 980 Pro. Yeah, but I guess so it's kind I mean, of a case of so it's you... kind of a case of I'm like, it's it's not unreasonable to get, excuse me, it's not unreasonable to get one. I suppose for, for their capacity and for their speed. Yeah. Um, yeah. But at the same time, it's kind of a case of, or you could buy literally the cheapest M2 SSD with a DRAM cache, and Which you wouldn't really notice the difference. Perfectly fine for most users. Exactly. So yeah, that's, oh, yeah, that's where that's I was kind of cut in because yeah, as. You know, um, uh, PC Bolt then said, "Sort of okay. Well, you know, what does that mean? What does that mean then?" And it's like to the average user, just a not, you know, a a, a decent SSD. So an NVMe SSD yeah. with uh, with with a DRAM cache is going to give you all the performance you need in a personal computer anyway. Uh, generally yeah. speaking, these are very niche use. And as Teltac pointed out as well, one could argue that if you need Optane in your server system, you might want to consider just restructuring the whole system. Um, so, yeah, as I say, that's... Yes, that's it partially depends on the size of the data set you're dealing with. And yeah. Stuff as well, I, or, how, I, or what the kind of, what kind of, of a, data set it is you're dealing with. Yeah. I think that's a sweeping generalization. I mean, Spud Nugget yeah. may be able to offer an answer there. A bit. I'd imagine he's typing furiously, though. So, um, is there any difference in DDR and GDDR? Um, yes. Yes. One has a G <laughs> and is designed for graphics works loads. Um, yes. On uh, an actual physical level, no, I can't remember what the differences are. I think it's mainly just, I think the main uh, difference it's... is just the bus and how it's attached to the system to all intents yes. and purposes. Yeah. It's it's a case of the, what it is optimized for. Yeah, because they are optimized in different ways. Um, yeah, it, it's a case of as far as I'm aware, there is slight, there is worse latency on GDDD, GDDR, but there is higher raw throughput <coughs> bandwidth um, from it, so you can shuff, shuffle more data backwards and forwards, mm. but accessing random bits of data is slower. Um, okay, yeah, that makes because sense. Because the data sets for graphics cards are more... Um, the data sets for graphics cards are more... Sequential. sequential. That's yeah. the word. Um, so, yeah. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and, uh, yes, Noel Dowds, um, you know, the interest the interest on uh, testing Enterprise for debloating, I am interested in doing that. I'm going to put it on my ideas list. Um, I would like to have a look at that because that might actually be a great way to talk about debloating. Um, as I say, don't ask me when it's coming out. I don't know when I get round to it. However, I do like the idea. I would like to make a video on that. Yeah, um, absolutely. So yeah, uh, listening to the PC. Uh, oh, that's something else. Uh, um, so yeah, for more information on stuff like this, it's difficult to really cover it. Um, comprehensively in a stream, especially when we're running out of time, um, because I think we're going to be wrapping up soon. Um, however, uh, either A, you'd have to go and do more reading about it, uh, or B, this is probably stuff that could be discussed in our Discord server, where people have got more time to give a more comprehensive response, I reckon. Yes, absolutely, and certainly a better researched response. <laughs> yes, exactly, rather than just like, ah, into the, into the, the chat. Um, yeah, absolutely. But yes, just a quick comment someone was saying about what's yeah. better, more RAM or faster RAM. Um, you're not going to see a performance difference, I would maintain, playing games between having 16 gigs of RAM and 32 gigs of RAM, because you're not going to hit the... you're not going to max out your RAM and start paging. Mm. The only time more RAM is faster is when you've already used up all of your RAM. Yeah. So if you're sitting at 15 gigs used, sticking in another 16 gigs is not going to make anything faster at all. Yeah, agree. The if vast you're sitting at 16 and a majority... half gigs used, then yes, it will make it faster because you're not paging. Yeah. The vast majority of people do not need more than 16 gigs of RAM. Um, 
Uh, like yeah. uh, now, obviously, there's there's always going to be someone, and I'm sure they'll be along any moment now to say, actually, I use Photoshop and I make billboard adverts. It's like you, if if you're in Photoshop, Most people, yeah, if you're if you're in Photoshop and you're making billboard adverts on an enormous Photoshop canvas with a hundred layers, yeah, you're gonna need a lot of RAM for that. That's a yeah. workstation load for a yeah. personal com- for a personal computer or a gaming rig. Rig, I defy most people to actually need more than 16 gigs of RAM. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my computer at home, uh, I can run a AAA game um, and be streaming at the same time with a bunch of Chrome windows open, my chat bots, and all the other stuff you need for streaming games. And I do that on 16 gigs of RAM. Now, absolutely. I start pushing the limits. like I start eking up into the 14, 15 gigabyte marker there. But... I still haven't run out of memory. Now, I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying that 32 gigs are a waste of time and stuff like that. However, if you're not sure if you need more than 16 gigs of RAM, you almost certainly don't. Absolutely. Um, The other thing I will say is that if you have 16 gigs, it's mm. easier to get 16 gigs in two DIMMs than it is to get 32 gigs in two DIMMs. And if you've only got two DIMMs, you'll invariably be able to run them at a lower latency and a higher clock speed, yeah. which will actually give you a performance difference. You're, you're, li- you're less likely to hit issues. Um, and uh, like on Intel systems, yeah. you're generally bomb-proof anyway, but certainly on, on AMD systems, unfortunately, it is a fact that when you build AMD, there is always a reasonable percentage chance that you're going to run into an XMP issue or some kind of memory configuration issue. Um, and while it doesn't happen very often, but it's never a problem until it is. And I've got friends who have issues with XMP. I've I've hit XMP issues when building computers, and yeah, it's it's real. It happens, and it does happen more to AMD systems than Intel. These are I, facts. I really want to actually play around with systems having these XMP issues mm. because I want to nail down where the XMP issue is. Yeah, unfortunately, if that makes sense. I, I I've got a friend who um I've got a friend who recently built a computer. It is a friend we have in common, and they they are currently running uh, they are currently running with XMP turned off, which is a crying shame because they've got a thirty nine hundred X, um and they're currently running with XMP off because they cannot get the system to run stable with XMP turned on. Uh, and I have try, I've said, try this, try this, try this. They've gone through all the easy ones. Like I've tried saying, right, just run it at like twenty six, sixty six megahertz XMP. It crashes, you know. So it's just like they're nowhere near stable, and I don't know why. And they are approximately a hundred miles away from me, so it's not possible to get hold of the computer. But yeah, like if you want to look into an XMP issue, that would be a cracking example of it. But unfortunately, mm. it's not possible to get hold of that system right now. I feel like, based on very much anecdotal We've tried evidence, it, Demney. We've tried more voltage. I think that most XMP issues are motherboards, not the RAM and not the processor. I feel yeah. like they're motherboard issues. It's got an Asus. It's got a decent Asus motherboard in it, um, which but is it's not to say, motherboard. Which is not to say that it's well. Asus motherboards are good, you know. How you know this is not to say that it's not the motherboard. It might be a faulty motherboard. You know, yeah. every brand can and will have faulty mo- uh, mods. Um, yeah. However, yeah, as I say, it's um, it could be the motherboard. It might just be a bad RAM kit. But again, it's an Asus motherboard. It's uh, Corsair RAM. You know, it's it's not shabby hardware mm. in there. Um, mm. And in and as I say, I think it's the Asus X570 Tough. Um, in that system and that's the same motherboard that we used in Kyle's PC that we built um, recently and on Kyle's computer we went into BIOS we turned on XMP and it just worked and he hasn't had any issue he's got the same RAM same motherboard that um, that, the, that my friend's build has and he's got no issues with it whatsoever my friend meanwhile again on the same motherboard and RAM cannot get XMP to turn on without crashing and yeah, and I don't know what's wrong. Uh, maybe I could solve it if I had the computer in front of me. But as I say, I've tried saying, you know, try under running it, try turning up the voltage slightly, try tweak, you know, um, uh, try tweaking these timings slightly. Cannot get it there. And obviously, I can't say to him, 
you know, dial in all these timings because, you know, he's not technologically illiterate, but if I gave him a page of RAM timings and said, dial in these RAM timings, he'd be like, dude, I can't do that. I don't know how to do that, you know? So, yeah. Um, yeah, so, it's just, yeah. I just find it very, I just find it very odd. Yeah, it is very odd. And that that's the problem with XMP issues is they shouldn't exist, but they do. And when you, when they, when you run into an XMP issue, Sometimes it's an easy fix. Sometimes you can just run, underrun the RAM slightly and it's fine. However, there are a couple yeah. of them out there that are absolute animals to solve. Yeah. I just find it so bizarre that on the complete flip side, I'm capable of running on like a second gen Ryzen, four sticks, 32 gigs of RAM, hmm. overclocked, tighter timings, yeah. no special voltages but maybe and that's because seconds to do it and i'm just kind of like it shocks me that there is such a yeah giant range of experiences yeah. but then also maybe that's because you've got a x570 aorus master that's a 350 pound odd motherboard yeah that, that's know? kind of my point that's Make, yeah. why i'm saying anecdotally is yeah. it, is, it is it a motherboard but thing? then on the other hand you know like again uh, uh, an x570 tough it's uh it's about 180 pounds that motherboard it's not a like it's not an expensive I mean, that's motherboard. a cheap x570 board though where a cheap x570 board is 120 140 yeah now granted for that you get something like the um uh, I have oh it's not within reach at the moment it's buried down the back of somewhere but I've got a gigabyte x570 motherboard that is basically a 100 pound motherboard that they super glued an x570 chip onto um and you know it's a pretty terrible motherboard but it does have an x570 chipset which mm. obviously is important because it gives it the CPU support in a way um mm. however now that's a cheap motherboard and you know the x570 tough it's got your 16 power phases and all and stuff like that and it's it's got the you know the the asus premiumness to it so i you know as i say it's not yeah. a super expensive motherboard but by the same token i don't think it's fair just to say that's a cheap motherboard because it's not there is much cheaper stuff out there you yeah. know so yeah i don't know and like also um you know other cases in point um i can't remember Oh, what were the boards I had? My uh my X4 my X470. No, my my B450 Aorus M, which was the terrible motherboard that I had a terrible time with, that had XMP problems out the wazoo. Uh but that was typically ish that was typically resolved um by just underrunning the RAM slightly. However, that same RAM I could drop that into my Asus um, X470 Gaming Strix, um, the oh, rock board. Oh, the Strix F Gaming yeah. thingy thingy. And yeah. that, that's the, the X470 Strix from Asus that would run exactly the same memory overclocked without custom timings. Um, so you could just, you, uh, that I could just take my 3400 RAM and just immediately just go run this at 3600 and it just gave me free speed. Yeah, on the Aorus M, I had to run it at 3200, otherwise it would crash. So, yeah. And now, as I say, that it, the motherboard does matter, um, I, I guess. Yeah. But I don't know where I was going with this. X XMP is a weird animal, and it's very difficult. A lot of people go sort of, oh, just up the RAM slightly and stuff like that. And I'm just like, it's not always that simple. There definitely are yeah. small things you can try doing. But, yeah, there are, it's, it's horrendous sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, but and yes, it, it, there there is a whole sort of yeah. consideration that you can go into with picking specific RAM modules yeah. and all of that stuff for um, you know for for if you're trying to actually push bleeding edge clocks and stuff. So yeah, yeah. It it depends on how much time and effort you're willing to put in it, and obviously you then become significantly restricted if you're like, no, it must have Corsair RGB. Because you're then stuffed if you want performance RAM. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> well, it, it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Performance. Because. Yeah. Because their crazy high, stupidly clocking stuff is all their vengeance LPX that has no mm. RGB. Yeah. Um, which and just a quick note. I've seen people abuse the heck out of. <laughs> yeah. Just a quick note from PC Bolt. What makes Aorus motherboards cheap? Um, not not all Aorus no. motherboards are crap. Um, basically, 
Uh, Aorus is Gigabyte's um, high-end branding. And, it's um, their game are, division. Yes, yeah, their gaming division. And um, there are certainly many Aorus boards, like the X570 Aorus Master, that are monster motherboards and are absolutely not cheap or bad. However, unfortunately, Gigabyte made the mistake of putting the Aorus branding on some of their low-end stuff, like the B450 Aorus M, which is just a terror, which is just not a good motherboard. It's it, it's certainly not. It certainly doesn't hold a candle to the high end Aorus stuff. So Aorus yeah. is not bad per se, but sometimes you see the Aorus branding on bad products. So yeah. as I say, um, take it with a pinch of salt. A lot of people will go sort of, oh, Gigabyte Aorus, it's terrible. But that's just because that person experienced one of the cheap Aorus boards, not yeah. one of the premium ones, but it just happened to have the Aorus branding on it. So now they associate Aorus with bad. So yeah, it swings exactly. and roundabouts. And it's a case of, I feel, in a sense, that Gigabyte are trying to get away from being called Gigabyte in the consumer space. Yeah. To a degree, and trying to be called Aorus. Yeah. And then leaving Gigabyte as their server space naming. Or they're certainly more server space naming. Yeah. Just because the fact that they're naming everything Aorus, and I'm half expecting us to see something like, you know, the... Um, the I was about to call it the Aorus Horus. <laughs> insert yeah. ran, insert random um Egyptian god here. Yeah. Um, as like a a sub sub brand, which is the cheap stuff, and then insert you know Roman deity here for high end Aorus stuff or something, and yeah. kind of see some random splitting like that. And this so is we end kind up with a sub brand with a sub sub brand. Yeah. Because I think this is almost what Asus have done with uh, Republic of Gamers. Because um, um, uh, cause for this is the thing, obviously, Republic of Gamers is the Asus high-end gaming division. Um, and uh, Asus have got it down, nailed down fairly sweet at the moment. They've got their low-end stuff is just Asus Prime. Um, then oh, their, yeah. their mid-range stuff is the Republic of Gamers Strix which is um, it's Republic of Gamers and this Strix one. For a long time, I was like, I don't understand the point of the Strix branding. Just call it the Republic of Gamers one because it's, you know, it's, got the, it's got the ROG badge on it. That's what everyone wants, wants. However, obviously, ROG Strix is still a cut below the top-end ROG gear um, because, you know, you can get a ROG Strix board for about £200 uh, or, you know, $200. And that's still a cut below the top end ROG gear. When you go into um, like the ROG Maximus or whatever the million other brands are for whether it's AMD or Intel and so on and so forth. Um, and so that's the thing. AMD have done exactly that where Ro Republic of Gamers is a sub-brand of, of Asus. However, ROG itself has sub-brands for Strix, Maximus, Whatever the other ones are, and so on. I don't bother remembering them because Ignorance. there's too damn yeah, there's too damn many of them. So yeah, um, so yeah, Blair. That's it. That's that's it. That's the end of what I've got, I guess. Um, yes, I. <clears throat> is there yeah, a way to force I, the motherboard I, to train RAM again? Uh, reset BIOS. Take the BIOS battery out. It depends on what motherboard you have. Yeah. Or take the CPU out and put it back in again. If you have a more overclocking focused board, you'll have a button that's called retry. And after a oh, failed yeah. post, it will retry those settings, retry those settings, retry those settings. And it will keep cycling those settings, rerunning the memory training. But memory training will just happen uh, every time you turn the computer on. If your settings are set to auto, it will do memory training on every boot. Which is mm. why your RAM timings, your probably your tertiaries only, but your tertiary timings will juggle a bit every time you reboot, because it's running the memory training every time the computer starts. So in a sense, the way to get memory training to rerun is just reboot and reboot and reboot, because that's ultimately all retry is doing. Yeah. Um, um, in a sense, you can sort of stop that a little bit by hard coding timings. Um. Mm. But then you'll need to run um, memory tests in IDA and things like that to confirm they're actually benefiting you. Yeah. 
And last one, I think, um, again from PC Bolt, um, Ga- uh, what do you think of Galax motherboards? Um, I've just quickly Googled them and I'm having a quick look. I haven't looked at any reviews, so I don't, I have, this is literally just what I've seen from a quick Google look. Uh, they make good looking boards. They look like low end boards to me, uh, which is not to say they're crap. Um, surprising considering where the rest of Galax's stuff is positioned. I was about to say, I was, I Googled them expecting to see absolute bottom of the barrel, like, um, Biostar level stuff where it's just like how cheap can we make this motherboard and have it still actually work um, however it looks like they've been putting out some motherboards that are aimed at gamers here but again I'm seeing like sort of um, I'm, I'm seeing like single VRM heat sinks as well which is just classic sign of just cut corners um, if they've been sending cool. yeah if they've been sending them out to um, reviewers then obviously they've got something that they think is actually worth having and the pictures look very nice i love the look of them they look well cool so, i was going to say um, i really like the b550m ex that's what i'm looking at at the moment it looks rad that's a- they, yeah. Someone has actually keyed in a design the entire way across a motherboard. And, and like, I love it when they do that. Someone's this, done it again. Yep, this is exactly what I love about my X470 Tai Chi, is that that was designed to look like that from the beginning. So the components in the silk screen all match that, although this is a really good example of that. So yeah, it, they, those motherboards look really nice. No idea how they perform. As I say, that B550 MEX looks really great. The VRM on it looks eh. However, it would be absolutely fine with low to mid-range CPUs in it. Like having a having a uh, forgettable VRM, that's only a problem if you want to run like 3900X, 3950 or 5900X, 5950, that kind of thing. If you're going to drop a like a, a Ryzen 3600 in or a 5600X, then a mm. average VRM is going to be absolutely fine. It's only an, it's yeah. only an issue having a weak VRM is only a problem if you want to r- want to run a top end CPU, and if you can run it if you're buying a top end CPU, you can probably afford a much higher end motherboard to go with it anyway. If you're um, sticking a seven hundred and fifty pound CPU in a hundred and forty pound motherboard, yeah, I probably gone wrong. I, I had a comment the other day on the um, uh, on my review of the uh, the MSI um, X. It wasn't an X490, it was an X390 uh, A Pro, which is the cheapest X390 motherboard money can buy. And they were just like, can this run an i9-9900K? And I'm like, don't put an i9 in this motherboard. <laughs> Basically, yeah. just you should... I'm sure it will run if, absolutely fine. Yeah, if, but if you can afford an settings, i9... But it's kind of a case of, but why? Yeah, if you can afford an i9, you can afford a motherboard that costs more than $100. So yeah, Absolutely. But yes, yeah. I'm kind of surprised that the Galax stuff looks a little bit cheap and a little bit off, only because obviously they've got Hall of Fame and stuff like that. And the Galax mm. Hall of Fames are always the top three GPUs inside each generation hmm. so you'll have the you know you'll have the um kingpin the hall of fame and the lightning until msi completely murdered the lightning ripped yeah. lightning um you know yeah. you kind of have those three um so it's just a bit weird uh there's no galax motherboards on amazon which makes me sad no i doubt there would be because yeah. as far as i'm aware they're they're very hay- heavily asian yeah in their general market and i feel like they're pushing into the us currently yeah which is why they're sending out all these review samples so it's kind of a case of i doubt we'll see them over here until they either have great success or they fail entirely yeah um they might pop up in germany Mm -hmm. yeah i mean if if galax wanted to send me one of their motherboards you're more than welcome to, and I'll do one of my reviews on it. <laughs> Absolutely. I Call feel me. like you probably actually have to mention that, you know, actually message them or something. Yeah, yeah. At some point during the year, I'll start doing that. I mean, I'd kind of, sorry, to pick up on someone making a comparison, i kind mm. of say, like, the problem there was you put Pirelli tyres on any car. <laughs> but on that bombshell. <laughs> um, oh, Strix means it runs quiet. Strix is owl. Hmm. Hmm. Big hmm. Anyway, DFI. Yes. All the yes. 
but God, also not the BFI today. LAN parties. Oh, yeah. why we can't have... we have motherboards that look good anymore? They looked good in their day. You'd never get away with that in a modern computer. However, on that bombshell, it's time to end because it's five to six, and we were oh. we are over time. Um, you too so... can extend the stream for us for a, for a uh, super chat of at least fifteen dollars. <laughs> no. <laughs> nope, we're ending, and we've got to end now. We have to end the stream before anyone has time to drop in a fifteen dollars super chat. Don't do it. Right, we're leaving. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. Thanks for tuning in as always. Thank you for the super chats we've had today. Much appreciated. Uh, can I have videos on monitors in the future? Um, I need to gather more monitors to have more experience with monitors. Um, lots of things coming up in the future. Um, yeah, this year should be a very exciting year for me. Um, but we'll see. We'll see when we get there. Anyway. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you soon. Um, more videos on the way. I've been recording stuff today as well. So, yeah. Uh, repair videos will be coming when I've got more repairs in the shop. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, as always, for joining me, Caradog. Absolutely. Um, Until and next time. We'll see you guys next week. Bye for now. Her Ciao. Hit the end stream. Goodbye. Toodles. Au revoir. Uh, oh, God damn it. I hit end stream and then YouTube is like, are you sure you want to end the stream? I'm like, yes, that's why I hit the end stream button.